Yeah, I think it looks good now. Oh, it looks pretty good. All right. So it's uh, 7.47, and uh, I think we're going to get started. It gives me a really great pleasure to introduce as a grand round speaker today, uh, my colleague and good friend, uh, Dan Schubert is currently the uh, Senior Vice President of Neurosurgery at Northwell Health and the Chair of Neurosurgery at North Shore Hospital in Long Island Jewish Medical Center here in New York. Uh, as you know, he's a world-renowned expert on spinal oncology and spinal tumor surgery. Uh, originally, his uh, medical training he actually received here in New York at Columbia University. He then went on to do his residency at John Hopkins in Baltimore. And uh, after residency, he concluded that with three fellowships. He did one research fellowship at the NIH in spinal oncology. He did a uh, complex spine fellowship at John Hopkins and then a uh, complex spine fellowship also at Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia. He then went back to John Hopkins to the ranks in neurosurgery, obviously uh, was incredibly productive in terms of his uh, academic output, more than 500, we just talked about it, more than, more than he finished his fellowship in 2009 and uh, he ended up now, uh, didn't end up because he's still obviously on the go, but uh, uh, more than 500 peer reviewed publications, quite remarkable, it's quite an accomplishment and it really speaks to his um, uh, efficiency and obviously his talent and his ability to really surround himself with talent and, 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 and good people and, and do fantastic basic science but also clinical uh, research uh, work. Uh, in 2005 he was inducted into the Miller Colson Academy of Clinical Excellence which is the highest clinical distinction at John Hopkins University and then earlier this year he joined us here in New York at, 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 uh, at Northwell. Uh, so then, you know, we've known each other for a number of years, from meetings, from courses, from all types of, uh, uh, you know, research and, and clinical activities. So it's great to have you as a, as a visiting professor, hopefully in person soon. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you about the current management and future innovations for patients with spinal tumors. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roger. And, you know, first and foremost, uh, thanks to you personally as a friend and as an innovator and as a, just a overall uh, fantastic teacher and colleague to me personally and and also thank you to the whole group at at Cornell and I know that I see some MSK people here as well um, you know you guys are leading leading the the areas not only in surgical innovations and care but you're educating so while I see the the educational forums every day or every week and uh, you guys are the vanguard with that so thank you for uh, leading and then teaching how to lead. And uh, thanks for, so I'm gonna talk today a little about a spine tumor, some of the stuff that we've all been part of for the last couple of decades and, and maybe where we, where we are now and where we're going. That's, that's the hope of this. And I won't, I won't go too long, but I'll leave some question time at the end so that people can say, I totally disagree with you, Shuba. I don't know what you're talking about. And we can go head to head. Um, so, oh, let's see, why is that not? Here we go. So here are my disclosures. Um, as, as usually is the case, I don't think these really have any bearings on what we're discussing today, but nonetheless, they're here. And so, you know, let's get into this a little bit. New cases of, of cancer are increasing each year in America. And I know we know this. And so, you know, why is this? Uh, it's probably partly because we're living longer. You know, people get all nervous about radiation and pollution and such. But, you know, when you have the average age now, now live much later, you have a higher chance of of getting a tumor. So in the United States, uh, you're able to get, uh, you're able to now have almost 2 million people who are newly diagnosed. It's not people living with cancer, it's new diagnosis of tumor. And when we think about spine, the majority is gonna be metastatic, not primary lesions. And when you look at new people, again, in the United States, this is NIH data, these are the types of tumors you're seeing each year, newly people with metastatic spine tumors, I'm sorry, coming from the breast, or the skin, or the lung, or the prostate, or the kidney, and there's others, but these are the most common. And so when you start adding these up, people with new metastatic spine tumors a year, not just people with new cancer a year, but new metastatic spine tumors, uh, are over a million people with spine tumors. That doesn't mean that we have to operate all of them, doesn't mean that all of them have to necessarily be treated aggressively, but this is kind of the deal, what we're dealing with. This is the, this is the scale and scope of what we're dealing with. And if for people who are the residents and students in this talk, and we talk about intrinsic brain tumors, gliomas, meningiomas, just to give you scale, the newly diagnosed intrinsic brain tumors, the GBMs, 
the oligos, the, the meningiomas and such, is about 25,000 a year newly diagnosed in America. So you have 25,000 new brain tumors a year, and you have 1 million new spine tumors a year. And these are just metastatic. So there's obviously primary tumors as well. Um, so this is the scale that you're thinking of. And when they present, overwhelmingly, they are symptomatic. So this is not something where uh, they are, you know, something that we can ignore. You know, about 90% have debilitating pain and about 75% have a neurologic deficit, whether it be ambulation, moving their arms, sensory, bowel and bladder and such. But this is, these patients present with issues, right? One, because of spinal cord proximity, the peripheral nerve and, and, the, and the, the spinal nerve proximity and the, and the lumbar plexus and the, and the cardioquina, but also uh, because of the structural abnormalities, right? If you take the spine, the spine is a machine, it is a mechanism, unlike the brain. So if you start damaging the actual internal structure, you're gonna have pain and potentially deficits that are dynamic. So patients often ask, you know, when you see a, a patient with a spine tumor and there's this infinitude that a number of us have really studied and said, okay, you gotta think about this and the other thing and these 15 different classification systems, but it really comes down to this question, right? This is really the question, what should I do? And so regardless of how we generalize patients, it still comes down to a personal discussion. And those discussions often are more than just what the spine looks like on an X-ray, what the life expectancy is of the patient. It's what the goals are of the patient. We're gonna discuss some of these nuances because I think this is really where the field is going. I mean, it's always gonna be clinical and scientific and radiographic, but really it's gonna be asking uh, what is the fit with the patient and where they are in their journey in life. Now, if, you, if you're able to answer the patient, what should I do? And this happens to me, the patient says, okay, thanks, Dr. Shuba. And then they say, but I have another question. The other question is, well, what would you do if you're me? And the issue is the same. That's the same question. I should be answering what is the problem for this patient? Not for Dan Shuba, not for um, the average patient. There is no average patient. It's for what they. And then science. Sometimes I give them that answer, and it's the same one. And they say, "Okay, well, what would you do if you were I were your mother?" And and that's this kind of question that people seem to think engenders my my empathy or my desire to, to to really give them the honest answer. But the fact is, my mother's different than this patient. So again, always be thinking about uh, this patient first and foremost. And so one thing that I bring up quite a bit in life, personally, and I bring it up with spine as well when I teach my residents and fellows is the idea of a sweet spot. And that's the idea, as you all know, no matter where you are, of trade-offs in life. Uh, uh, Roger and I were on just a couple minutes early and he was asking about, should I move into the city or into uh, Long Island or Westchester? And I said, well, my wife likes grass uh, and your yard. And he said, trade-offs, you know, trade-offs. And that's the issue of, of life. And so when we think of sweet spot, oh, let's see. There we go. Um, some people think about it with a golf, uh, a golf club. Some people think about it with a tennis racket. Some people think about something like this, where you're really, if you can combine the strengths in your life, things you do well with the things you like, that really is where you succeed as your sweet spot in life is something that overlaps between your strengths and passions. Obviously, uh, this is my excuse to drink wine is that I'm, I'm an artist and I'm a scientist and I'm combining this, this wonderful thing into wine. Uh, but there's a, probably a third diagram of, you know, have a good time. And that probably dominates the most, but these is the idea that we want to overlap. And when it comes to spine tumor surgery or, or management, there's this one extreme where we sit there and say, well, I want to have resection of the tumor. I want to stabilize. I want to have alignment, all these things that we shoot for. And if you're really going to be extreme on that, if you really want to push those, you can get into trouble, right? If you want to be the most stable, the most resected, the best alignment, you're going to probably have to trade some, some uh, invasiveness for that. On the other hand, if you say, I want to be completely safe, uh, surgically, that is, uh, and, and maybe give the value of the patient. Value of the patient, maybe they say, I want to be in the hospital, not at all. I don't even want to come into the hospital. I don't even want to see you in clinic. I really want to just not be bothered with this. Well, then you're doing the, the least potential uh, procedure. And, and that might be nice short-term, but long-term, uh, it's not going to be uh, something that provides significant long-term value. So you're probably looking at some kind of sweet spot in between doing the maximal uh, extent deluxe type of surgery and and you know, mailing it in and doing something very small. And the patient says, thanks for that little tiny thing that didn't do as much, but my incision is really small, for example. The truth of the matter is, as I'm alluding to, is that, uh, it, it, you know, it, can you handle the truth? The truth of the matter is it's actually very tough to find a sweet spot, but that's what we do. We try to find a range and nothing is perfect. And so as, for example, the younger people in the audience sit there and say, well, I wanna know what to do. The answer is there's nothing perfect. You're trying to get in this range of what's best for the patient at this time in their lives. So for example, here, here's some issues that I, I feel like maybe we can argue, we can look back in the retrospectoscope and say, when was too little and too much resected? So this is a patient who had 
um, an operation done, OC fusion, and uh, resected some of the chordoma uh, of the C2 area. And uh, the chordoma, as you can imagine, grew uh, into the, somewhat into the pharynx. It grew into the, uh, into the vertebral arteries and such. And they said, what do I do now? And I say, uh, you know, I think we're really just, you know, down with doing whack-a-mole now. It's, it's a harder, you were chasing this. And so in this case, I would have been probably more aggressive, albeit these are challenging C2 chordomas. Um, on the other hand, here's a, a patient of a, a case of a patient who was a friend of mine sent me to me, and, and this is a renal cell, oligometastatic renal cell, with the idea this was the only site of the body of the metastatic renal cell. The kidney was removed, no other sites, and they said, we're going to take this out on block and give potentially long-term control. And there's some suggestion that this may be uh, uh, something that gives longer term control. It's the only tumor in the body. And so they did this operation and upon rotating out this tumor, you can see the beautiful images and it's almost like a completely curated, uh, a beautiful picture of the operating room and the images. But as they rotate this lesion out, the patient lost motors and uh, remained pretty much wheelchair bound from a basically uh, intraoperative uh, spinal cord manipulation that left them very, very weak. And so you can sit there and say, wow, do we have to get that whole thing out at one piece and rotate around the spinal cord and and risk, and risk uh, a spinal cord injury. So in this case was too much done. Uh, uh, and of course, if it were not for that complication, it would, it would have been a perfect uh, operation, but it argues a point, how big do we have to be in someone with metastatic disease? So what really guides us? Um, I think there's really five things that guide us. And this is, this is stuff that's been uh, 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 obviously based on the work of many, many other people, but you know the NOMS criterion, which was the, the one popularized at MSK by Mark Bilski and Little Offer, uh, is four things. I really think there's five things because there's that last one, uh, which is really satisfaction and what I would call the third one, which is local tumor control. Uh, so I added a little bit to this. But let's go through these. And again, these are things that you have to touch on. These are things you have to think about when you are engaging with someone. It can't be all one of them. But you can imagine in patients who are grossly unstable, that may drive the bus versus someone who has a debilitating deformity may drive the bus more than uh, someone who has spinal cord compression has neurological deficits. So there's always, these always have to be touched on. Spinal cord compression, this is the first one. This is what we're pretty good at. As neurosurgeons, neurologists, and uh, neuroradiologists, we, we think we know what this, we, th we think we understand this, right? And this is important. Um, and here's this big, this, you know, don't read this, but this is the paper that came out when I was in training, uh, which is the Patchell study, Roy Patchell, who basically looked at a randomized control trial about for metastatic epidural spinal cord compression, someone who's weak or has spinal cord compression, do you operate or do you radiate? And the operation would be operation plus radiation, the radiation was radiation alone. And for all those people who don't know this, who don't know the history, it's, this study was expected to show that radiation was far better. They believed that those patients would pass away. And if you operate on these sick patients, they would obviously succumb to the disease even faster because you were aggressive with their surgery and they probably couldn't handle the surgery. So there was all these presumptions that surgery would be the lesser. And so this is a randomized study uh, and this study was stopped early because the study showed overwhelmingly that surgery plus radiation was better than radiation alone. And probably the reason for that was largely because we stabilized during that time and patients were able to ambulate and they didn't get DVTs and pneumonia uh, and PEs. And so this, of course, in my stage, you know, people were uh, in the 90s were throwing tomatoes at surgeons who did surgery on metastatic disease at national meetings. They was very, very, very uh, openly uh, contested. They were saying, you know, why are you doing this to these poor people? with stage four cancer, their spine. Uh, and then in 2005, then everyone started operating on, on everything and, and maybe the, the pendulum is finally swinging back to where we're a little bit more judicious in thinking about what's the best for patients. And this is a slide I borrowed from Mark, which really shows uh, both the N and the O of his noms, neuro neurological and oncologic. And it's really a combination of the two that helps you uh, uh, kind of interpret the, the Patchell study. So for example, if you go to zero, where there's a tumor off to the left side of the spinal canal, and it's really not compressive. That's a zero compression on the thecal sac. One is starting to indent the thecal sac. Two is really obliterating the thecal sac, and three is obviously distorting the cord. And you can imagine, although this is not completely one-to-one -one correlation, that the patient zero is neurologically intact, and then likely three is not, and is worse than, say, two. Now, if you combine this compression or neurological presentation with the radiation sensitivity, it gives you a sense of really how to interpret the Patchell study. And so, for example, in theory, if all these are myeloma, any one of them, I mean, I would argue that in three, you got to be really careful because if that patient's rapidly declining, you would likely want to operate very quickly. However, if these patients were, for some reason, all neurologically intact and it was myeloma, you can give them conventional radiation in about five days, the tumor's gone. And, and we have pictures of that showing the tumor completely gone in five days. Uh, if it's breast cancer, it's a little bit 
uh, uh, less uh, uh, sensitive as, as myeloma, but still sensitive. But if you have lung cancer, renal, or sarcoma, uh, standard radiation doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. You give it and the tumor doesn't die. If you turn up the dose to kill the tumor, you'll also kill the, the gut and the esophagus and the skin. So standard radiation is not uh, 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 good for these patients. Uh, however, when focus radiation came about, even in the form of proton beam or other forms of conformal, IMRT, cyber knife, et cetera, we could increase the dose and not harm the nearby structures. So for a zero, you could completely draw your uh, circle of your radiation with a physicist around that tumor and have a very, very high dose that would be able to kill a renal cell that looked like zero. And maybe even for one, if the radiation oncologist felt that they could have a, 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 a very conformal dose, but around two and three, you can't because you would actually expose the spinal cord to that high dose. Or you'd say, let's not expose the epidural space and let's leave that tumor and radi radiate everything else, which would actually be a, a really bad strategic move because then the tumor that's near the cord would be the part that grows, which is the part you're most concerned about. So really the way to interpret that Patchell study is in patients who have radiation resistant tumors and high grade compression, either two or three, you have to do a separation surgery of some type, either a complete resection or separate the tumor away from the cord and then deliver high dose radiation. While in zero and one, you can probably rate it with conformal high dose radiation. And again, if it's very, very sensitive, you might be able to get away with it for all of them. But that's really the idea. So when you look back in the Patchell study, you're treating those, if it's a renal cell or lung cancer, you're really treating them if they're high grade compression with surging radiation in some form. Uh, and if it's uh, the one, zero or one, uh, you can obviously have more options. Instability, again, I think this is, is really best in the hands of surgeons. And uh, for me, this was always a gestalt that I, I was challenged by when I was in my training. I'd say to some very, very well-known surgeons who mentored me, I'd say, how do you know it's unstable? And they'd say, because it is, because you can tell. Then I'd say, I can't tell. You know, I, I just started this thing. And they'd say, well, that one's unstable and that one's a little less unstable. That one's really unstable. And so a lot of us felt this way and we thought it was hard to communicate. And so we thought we should be a little more objective in defining how we term stability. So this uh, was a group of, uh, of us who did this back in the, the early 2000s and we, or the mid 2000s, we brought together surgeons, ortho and neuro, oncologists, both medical and radiation oncology, and said, let's try to have a, an idea. And it was a, it was a modified Delphi. This is, not, this is not math, this is not physics. This is still um, very biased opinions uh, in a modified Delphi approach. And, and this was the overall statement, which is great and accurate, but not so helpful. Uh, this really came from the Punjabi state, uh, uh, comments about what instability is, and the Punjabi comments are very similar to this, white and Punjabi, uh, but this was in the setting of cancer. So it was really the loss of spinal integrity as a result of a tumor associated with pain, deformity, or neurologic compromise. And no one's gonna disagree with this, but the fact of the matter is, again, does this actually tell us what's stable or unstable or impending instability? So we, we thought about uh, uh, putting a number of things together, and, and this has been under some criticism over the years, but it's, it's stood up somewhat. And the idea is that you probably should be thinking about location, whether it's mechanical pain, which I think is probably the most sensitive clinical aspect of anything. If a patient hurts when they sit up or lie down and they're, they're, they can find a position of comfort, but then they move and it hurts, is probably more sensitive and more specific than all these little radiographic findings. But nonetheless, how if it's lytic or, or blastic, if its alignment is off, if the virtual bodies collapse, and of course, posterior lateral involvement, which was really popularized by the t lix and the s lix system in spinal trauma, where once you tore those posterior elements, uh, you really got unstable in the same way with a tumor. If you took the posterior elements with the facets, you could have significant catastrophic failure. And this has been shown to be reliable, not just among surgeons, but of radonc and radiologists, and uh, it's, it's been predictive. So here's a patient who I saw a while back. I'm just giving an example to go through. These are a patient with a lytic tumor, uh, a car metastatic carcinoid to the sacrum, also at a spondy, by the way, a degen spondy at uh, four or five, as you can see there. And if you don't uh, know, you kind of, this is uh, now you can have apps with this and you can go on your phone and just have this and it calculates it, but you could kind of go through this and say, well, it's junctional, it's mechanical pain lytic. Uh, she did have some deformity there, virtual body collapse and post and vomit. She's 15, she's unstable by the characterization of this. And so for this, this patient underwent a posterior stabilization with radiation uh, uh, in that era. Once again, metastatic, no need to remove this on block. We'll get to that. Here's a patient with breast cancer. And uh, this was uh, sent to me <clears throat> uh, uh, a month or so after this patient was uh, evaluated and treated. And here's a lesion. You can say, you know what? Thoracic spine, it looks pretty stable. You know, it's a stable part of the spine. There's a sternum involved. <clears throat> and you look at the CT and you say, well, most of the body's gone. One pedicle's gone. 
I don't know about this one. Uh, and so if you sit there and say, I need some help with this, you can actually start adding this up and you'll get something that's potentially unstable. And so whenever I see things in gray, I always like scratch my leg. This is where the, 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 the characterization should really, really help you. You know, we know when things are black and white, it's the grays that should challenge us. And the majority of us, uh, of us live in the grays in our lives. We're not, you know, so this potential unstable, I think actually should perk your ears up more because um, what, what, what a number of us are suggesting now is that we shouldn't just think of the sins as a state, as a static idea. We should think of it as dynamic. And what are we going to do this patient? Are we going to do anything different with them? Are we going to do a laminectomy over that? You do a laminectomy over that, maybe it is unstable. So this patient underwent focused radiation to that area and about a month later uh, fractured and had incapacitating upper thoracic pain and, and some hand issues, I think. So now you look at this and say, well, of course, now this probably is unstable and it is. And so we sit there and say, hmm, did that potentially unstable tell the future? No, but in the setting of some data that we have, here's the treatment that I did for her. Some of the data we have is that when you radiate these patients with high dose radiation, we know that uh, the likelihood of fracture is based on the remaining bone and how much bone was taken. Now, if you radiate, you're gonna kill that bone. And so there's some data, this is probably one of the biggest studies showing that there's probably up to a 15% almost chance of fracture. And the, and, the, and the risk factors are some of these here, lytic disease, uh, poor bone quality, et cetera, older age. So maybe we have to be aggressive. Maybe this patient, uh, in addition to having radiation, could have had a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty at that level to kind of protect her from that fusion. So something to think about, not that she has to have an aggressive surgery, but something that you might've wanted to protect that. The next idea is, is local control. And this is really for that primary tumor that's radiation resistant. So for example, um, I'm just turning off my other computer to make sure it's quiet. Um, the, this is the idea of, can we cure patients? This is rare, right? This is not common, but when it happens, it's a big deal because if you have a chance to cure someone and you don't think about it, that you, we lose that opportunity. So although rare, it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal when it comes. So these are those patients like chordomas or chondrosarcomas or, or local spinal sarcomas. And uh, what I'll do is I'll break this into, into regional areas because I know we have a number of surgeons in the room and these are things that really challenge me. And I think about these things a lot. And so you have to think about it with the regional, with the regional anatomy. And as we're learning everything in healthcare is regional and no difference when we think about operating. So the regional, so let's start the cervical, really going from top down. And, and you can, you can, it's a little different than a, than a clival chordoma, so it's handled differently. Um, but let's talk about going from the cervical down and, 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 not ex, and, and not include things like clival chordomas, which are a little bit different. But the bony constraints of cervical chordomas are the jaw and the sternum, so high and low. And the regional soft tissue constraints are the esophagus, obviously, and the trachea. And you might say, Shuba, come on, man. Like, that's, you don't have to write that. Everyone knows that. But uh, we can transpose the esophagus and we can transpose the trachea. Um, but uh, it's a little bit much. Um, the vertebral arteries, obviously, uh, you have two. Sometimes you can sacrifice one. The carotids can be bypassed. Um, but you really don't want to sacrifice these things for these tumors. And then the nerves, you think about the hypoglossal and the phrenic. And the range, and you see me have things in here like with parentheses and you're like, Shuba, oh my goodness, what's wrong with you? We don't like to sacrifice any roots. Why do you have those things in parentheses? And the issue is C5 is extremely debilitating to sacrifice. The C8 and T1, which is your hand, is extremely debilitating. But patients without a C7 can tolerate things because gravity helps their triceps. And so people with a C7 radiculopathy, you might not know when they walk in your office until you actually challenge them uh, if they're weak in their triceps. But a patient with a C5 weakness you notice right away because they can't lift their arm to shake your hand or they can't touch their face, for example. So um, these are, these are uh, the kind of levels. So uh, this is a, a case uh, that I did a, about a year ago. Um, and uh, I call this upper occipital cervical. You might say that's redundant. Why is it not just occipital cervical? And the issue is because we'll show you that these are actually nuanced a little bit. So if you look at the top of her tumor, it goes all the way up almost the top of her nasopharynx. Um, not, you know, past her hard palate. This is very, very high. Her C2 is actually quite high in her face uh, compared to, I'll, I'll show you one after this. Um, and so this one uh, may, is very challenging from a point of access from the front. Here you see this tumor. This was sent from a colleague of ours uh, out in the Midwest uh, and said, you know, I think it's inoperable, but see if you can take your chance at this. Uh, and um, here's the CT. And, you know, when we think about this, and this is something that I think a lot of uh, skull-based surgeons think about, you know, whether it's a sublabial, transnasal approach, transoral, and transcervical, and you do see some overlap. And, and this is an idea of how to get to certain lesions. Obviously, if you want to pull a tumor out that big, I will tell you, you cannot pull that through the nose unless you do Lafort type osteotomies and, and do very, very aggressive transnasal approaches. Pulling it through the mouth, there's not enough room in most people's mouths to pull this out. 
Um, and then transcervical, you might have the angle. You can't get above that. So this is a combined approach where you're combining a transoral and transcervical or a transmandibular uh, approach. And, and I, I highlight this with this picture here where the tumor is in like a magenta or a, cy or a cyan. I don't know what that color, like a blue-green color. And you can see the IVC, I mean, the, uh, the jugulars and the uh, carotids. But you can see I, I, I removed the jaw in this picture. And, uh, and that's a little bit um, foreboding or, or you know, uh, foreshadowing, I should say, uh, for this uh, type of picture. And you can see here the tumor as it wraps uh, around the vert in that side and goes to the back. Uh, we wrote a paper on this, and, and, and it's not important what we concluded uh, per se. I mean, it's, 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 it's really just to kind of challenge the idea of what can you do when you have a tumor around a vertebral artery. And a lot of people have thoughts about this. And I think that everyone would agree with at least the assumptions we made, and we found this to be the case in our, our paper, that it really comes down to three things. It comes down to oncologic, mechanic, which I would call geometric uh, and vascular. In other words, if it's, a, if it's a metastatic lesion, you're probably not taking that vert because the tumor is elsewhere in the body. Um, if it's completely, if it's just touching the vert, um, maybe you can remove the tumor on block without touching it. You know, you can take it, take it off the vert. If it's circumferential, that's different, right? And then finally, uh, what's the vascular uh, uh, anatomy to the brain? And so you can imagine a metastatic lesion that's completely circumferential and on a, on a, on a, on a uh, you know, dominant vert, you would be very careful not to even go close to that vertebral artery because it's so not worth it. On the other hand, a patient with a primary tumor that's, you know, less than 180 degrees circumferential and maybe has two verts, and one of which is small, you could arguably, you could argue you could take that vert. And so this is the kind of thinking in the, in this, the, the flow diagram is a little bit uh, challenging, but that's the idea. And so this lady underwent a, a, a um, sacrifice that vertebral artery with endovascular. I do not do those myself. And we get the interventionals help us. And we do a posterior approach first where we release the tumor in the back where the tumor is not involved. Place a silastic sheath. People think the main reason for that is so that you can see uh, the dura when you're coming from the front. And that is true. I think actually more important than that is that if you can actually slide the silastic sheath, that means you've dissected the dura off the tumor. Because what you don't want to do is start pulling in the front and you have something still stuck and you pull harder and then you uh, have a motor change or you see CSF gushing out. So the silastic sheath is almost your test way to say, I actually am completely separated. Uh, so uh, it's actually kind of nice. And then this lady, I want her to fuse given the large defect we would leave. And so here's, this is for all the non-orthopedic surgeons listening. That is the fibula, that is part of the leg. It is a bone in the leg, um, but just remember your medical school, but this is the idea. And then you can have these nice drawings, which, which look a little bit like the reality when you expose this. Uh, and you basically have to get this access that we kind of alluded to, to be able to really get above this. And you can see the tumor deep to what's uh, tagged off with a hypoglossal and the lingual nerve, uh, as well as you can see the carotid artery there. And then you can, uh, you can move that tumor and those are the nerves still uh, uh, going across. And you can see the uh, rod from the back uh, that I placed in the back and there's the dura covered with a, 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 a dural matrix to cover it, to protect it. Um, once we've done that and here's the tumor, you can see that the odontoid process kind of sticking straight up. And then you replace this with a, with a pedicled flap. So this heals. And then you get your uh, oral maxillofacial surgeon in to close this. Uh, don't think you can do this yourself. You can if the teeth are malocclusion or the lip vermin border doesn't look great. Uh, they're going to be talking about that more than their chordoma about how you didn't put their face back together correctly. So this is getting them involved to make sure the jaws is correctly put back together. And this lady has a normal swallowing and normal function. She obviously had a peg and trach for a while, has it lost that, you know, got rid of that after a month and a half. And now this is fusing through uh, uh, nicely. Uh, this is an occipital cervical case, which is a little lower. And you might sit there and say, no, it's the same exact tumor shoe, but it's a C2 chordoma. And I'm saying, no, it's actually lower based on his mouth. And I don't like to have to go to people's mouths if I don't want, even though I show that to start. And so what we did on this patient is we actually went from the back and I stopped at C1, similar to operation C1. And this is not enough. Having one C1 on one side to hold this construct is gonna be too wimpy. I don't think if we, if we God bless this guy to cure him, this is gonna fail. Uh, so, but why did I only go to the, because I wanted to be able to bring him back and go in the front and really extend his head, which I would not be able to do with an OC fusion and extend his head and go under his jaw to avoid a trans or a transmandibular and then do a, a neck operation where you can take out the tumor. And there's the dura in the front. Uh, I'm sorry, the dura from the front exposed and here's the tumor. And then I reconstructed this with a cage, uh, with bone inside of it. Uh, and then I went in the back as a small third stage and locked him into this, to the occiput. Uh, and he's fused uh, in this area as well. And you can see the tumor taken out. And he's, I think he's actually two years out with no local recurrence. So 
did he have a peg? He had a peg, uh, 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 and then it came out uh, after a couple months that he works as a doctor. This is a physician who works full time. So um, this is the kind of things we might want to do. As you get lower subaxial, uh, here's a subaxial tumor. This is like you sit there and say, hey, I don't have the jaw in my way. I don't have the sternum in my way. Uh, but what you do have is you have you know those nerves you can't take. Like I took the C2s and C3s with impunity. Well, now you're sitting here looking at C5 and C6 and C7, and the issue becomes get, in, get oncology involved. This is part of the teamwork of being an oncology type surgeon is you got to get your oncology involved. This is a liposarcoma. Uh, and I don't know much about liposarcoma, I'll be honest. So I asked my oncologist and they told me that this type of tumor uh, should be treated with chemotherapy first to be shrunken down. Um, and I said, but I, if I get this out as one piece, he's going to lose his five or six or seven. He's going to basically have a flail arm. We can do some nerve grass, but they might not work that well. And they said to me, if he does not have the surgery, um, his survival is less than 3% at five years. If he has a surgery, it might be up to 15%. Uh, he's been out at least five years with no local recurrence so, or, or distant recurrence. So this is the idea that you have to talk to these people because when you sit there and say, oh, the surgeon told me that I'm going to lose my shoulder function. Uh, why did you do that to me? Uh, you have to share this decision with the family and say, this is what I'm hearing from the oncologist. Do you want to go for this aggressive surgery? And so here you can see similar, you go in the back, you see those nerve roots tied off. Um, and those are important nerve roots. And then you go from the front, uh, there's a little bit more than a standard anterocervical discectomy approach, but not significantly different, just longer and more exposed, taking the tumor out. You can see actually the brachial plexus that's cut from the front now. This is the stump of the brachial plexus, and here's the drain and the, and the rod from the back. And then once again, reconstructed uh, with fibula, uh, that's hammered inside that so they can actually fuse. Because again, if you put little dead bone uh, morselized in here, uh, you're probably not going to fuse. This is a child probably would fuse in the posterior elements on one side, but these are really, these, these fail quite a bit. And as you get down to the sternum, now it becomes a different issue. So this is a, des this is a, a desmoid tumor uh, sent to me uh, with, the, with the recommendation uh, at a very uh, well-known cancer center to take to upper uh, quadrant amputation, take the shoulder with the arm. And we said, how about we just, um, how about we just do, the, uh, the, do it as an on-block tumor? And here we took her out. And here you can see what's exposed is the parotid sheath opened. Um, you can sacrifice the internal jugular vein. Uh, you can take the anterior, the external, the internal. Uh, people can set, you can actually sacrifice most things except those things we talked about. Um, here's the sternocleidomastoid. Uh, uh, here is now the foot is to the left and the head is to the right. And this is the sternum open with the CD nominate vein in the front. And this allowed us to get to the bottom of the tumor because it was right cradled by the subclavian of the vertebral artery. In fact, um, the, we actually remember, I remember getting into this thyroid cervical trunk as we developed this and we had to clamp that off. So that you have really one exposure uh, as you get into the chest. And you can take this tumor out as one piece. And here's the sternocleidomastoid uh, uh, reflected back. You've got to watch out for that a accessory nerve below it because you don't want to give the patient a uh, uh, wing scapula just by doing exposure. Um, so when we think about local uh, um, in the thoracic, it is, again, is the sternum and the rib cage, but, and of course the heart and the great vessels and the diaphragm, but this is an area that we usually can do this with more impunity other than, other than the sacral tip because we can sacrifice nerve roots and rotate this out. This is a patient I did just uh, a last uh, uh, week, two weeks ago with a chordoma at uh, basically part of T8, T9, T10. And this was approached from the back completely. Uh, we thought we could get this out from the back. And, and this is the kind of ideas that you dissect and take the ribs, dissect completely around, find the, find the, um, the intercostals or the uh, segmental vessels, which are the hardest part for me for the operation to identify those down deep. And here you can see the left picture, which is the tumor in situ down to the pedicle where the tumor was in the pedicle and the tumor in situ and the, and the ribs taken as the pleura, pleura intact on both sides. Uh, and then when we rotate it out, you can see the azygous vein and the aorta down deep. And here you can see what the quad rod construct with the cage tumor taken out and then reconstructed again with, uh, with bone placed in. Same thing with thoracal abdominal. Only difference with this is you've got to think about the diaphragm and release that, uh, but the same idea holds of taking that out and putting a cage. And you can see with these primaries, I'm, I'm not using the distractible cages like I use in METs because uh, those usually don't fuse as well. And if you're taking all that bone in the back, I really do want to fuse in the front. Um, in terms of lumbar, the bony constraints really are none. It's really uh, a visceral and neurologic, the great vessels, the abdominal viscera and the nerve roots. Again, parenthetically, um, I actually should have those roots as being um, the ones I care about more. Uh, not parentheses, the lumbar roots three and four, you can't walk without an extension orthosis on your knee. While you can, if you have an L5 or an S1, um, you know, you may have a foot drop. You take L1, you may have a little bit of villus weakness, but you take three and four and you can't extend your knee. It's a big deal. Here's, a, here's an L5 or L, L4, uh, a chordoma. And once again, going in the back, 
uh, keep uh, skeletonizing those nerve roots, and then doing a transperitoneal approach. Why transperitoneal? Retroperitoneal because you don't have the access to rotate it. It really is quite challenging. We just did this uh, last week. I'll show you a case on that. You really need that access. Um, and then you can get this out in one piece and reconstruct it. This patient had osteoporosis, so use cement. Finally, when you get to the sacrum, the regional bone again strains are really the pelvis. The soft tissue constraints, again, are really viscera, nerve roots. And this was a paper written years ago about thinking about this, not only from a structural, but from a neurologic point of view. Um, so the lower you go, the less you have to involve stabilization, the lower you go, the less neurology you have. So low sacral amputations maybe don't do much uh, and you don't have to stabilize them while a total sacrectomy obviously hurts the patient significantly potentially, or the tumor at least does, and you don't have that recover, and then you have to stabilize it. And these are some of the ideas about the cuts that we have to do. Here's a patient with a sacral chordoma uh, that is a total on block sacral chordoma. You go in the front, dissect the vessels off here, elastic sheath, again, showing that I'm dissected off the, the viscera and off the great vessels. And then you go in the back, and here you can see, it doesn't really look as much like the artist rendition, but those are the L5 roots coming out bilaterally because we sacrificed, here's a specimen. And then you can reconstruct that in different ways. Again, the goal may be to reconstruct the pelvic ring as well. And here's the specimen that we take out. Um, here's one I did last week. And the reason I show this is just to add, there's a little picture here. You can see the S1 on the left. Uh, and this is the actually VRAM in the front. Sometimes we'll do a VRAM flap, which is rectus abdominis. Here's the right side L5 with the iliac artery below it and the iliac vein below that. And here's a specimen coming out. But this is the idea is that we pull that little piece. If I go back, this little tiny thing uh, is actually the, the rectus that's put in front. It looks like a kind of like a flank stake. Uh, where you kind of, which is exactly what it is really, it's an abdominal, and you kind of pull this in to help heal this area because a big hole was placed. Finally, uh, the last couple of things, a debilitating deformity. Um, when people say I did a tumor surgery and I saved the patient's life or I prevented it from getting weak, you can't do this and, and, and leave the patient with a long-term debilitating problem where their head is on their chest, chin, their chin is on their chest, or they're bent in half. This is a, a really good study showing when patients, this is a deformity, have a AIS uh, where they, on the left where they really don't complain much, of anything, but they have a deformity. It's a normal function. But if you go all the way to the right, their quality of life is so poor that actually to compare them to anyone because they're decompensated, they'd have to be blind, amputee, lung and heart failure. So when patients are deformed, they really are unhappy. And we have all these factors that we think about in deformity. You should also think about with the tumors. I know that you want to, might be doing it in the middle of the night. I mean, you might be trying to save this patient's spinal cord, but if you fuse them kyphotic, you're unhappy. And not that you have to understand this picture, but these are things we think about in deformity. We get really, really geeky with this stuff, but the idea is that the, the vertical axis, the horizontal gaze is really important. And can tumors do this? Of course. In areas where the, where the vertical axis is straight up and down, maybe it doesn't deform it, but in areas of any type of angulation, they can get bad. So for example, in these certain areas, there's more of a, just a blowout burst fracture, but just like we see when we stop at the thoracal lumbar junction for lumbar fusions, they can become significantly kyphotic. And if you take off their posterior elements, uh, they can have translation of formies, just like to, to find in the defined in the, in the trauma literature. So you have to be careful that we're not inducing deformities or, or untreating the deformities. Uh, here's a laminectomy done. Uh, you know, we've, we've written on this where laminectomy is done for intradural tumors. Here's a young girl who had an intramedullary spinal cord tumor, came from Denver to uh, Baltimore uh, about three or four years ago uh, and was treated by a colleague of mine. And they took the whole intramedullary tumor out and they were so, so happy with the results and she did great. Uh, she's about 20 years old, but then she started falling and falling and falling. And they said, keep doing PT. And she ended up having terrible low back pain because she was extending her low back to make up for this translation to form in her head. Uh, and you can see that her lumbar lordosis here is greater than her pelvic incidence. So she's basically trying to pull her head back because she's had incompetence of the posterior element. So here you see the MRI and you can see the spinal cord, tu the, the tumor, it's the spinal cord itself, you can see it was operated on. And look, she's already fusing right in front of where the defect was. And she started to really ankylose there. So this lady underwent a front back where we went in the front and now did an ACDF to, 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 to break those osteophytes up and then go in the back. Obviously, if you'd maybe put some screws in the back in the first place, maybe this would have been avoided. So thinking about just, that would have been easier, right? So thinking about just putting some screws on both sides of that tumor rather than doing a front back might've been something to save for an operation. Here's a, here's a case of a myeloma done in the middle of the night by a colleague of mine where they did a laminectomy for myeloma, found it was myeloma, stopped the case and radiated and said, you know, nailed that one. Uh, but the patient has poor bone and had a laminectomy above a kyphotic area and this fractured and the patient had significantly more myelopathy than from the previous. And so um, they sent this patient to me and I said, well, uh, this patient's like a long time and they can handle this surgery. So, uh, you know, go big. And here's the idea of, of treating this patient with poor bone. Um, finally, the last thing I'll say is survival and satisfaction. Uh, you know, this is a paper that we looked at. We looked at the, the, the data out in the field 
And we said, you know, what has been published? And you guys might say, thanks, Shuba, for nothing. Thanks for the newsflash. We found out that who benefits uh, people with good quality of life, good function, and good neurologic function. And you're like, thanks for the newsflash, Shuba. We already knew that. But it really does show that we really don't know. And really what, what I've kind of uh, uh, agreed with a lot of specialists is that the quality of life is really your difference between your expectations and your experiences. So for example, if a patient expects to walk with a cane after surgery and they experience that, they actually are quite uh, good about saying, I, 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 my quality of life is good. However, if they're gonna run a marathon in their mind, but they really experience walking with a cane, they will be unhappy. And so when we look at, uh, and, th and this means you have to be very specific. So if you look me up right now, based on my age and sex, social security gives me a point estimate that I'm gonna live to be 79. If you go to this, uh, this blueprint income, which is a wealth management out of Wharton, I did go to Wharton, but no, no relation to this. They actually look at what you eat, what your waistline is, what your height is, uh, your family history, and they predict that I'm gonna live a 75% chance to 91. Now you might say, I like this better because it says 91 versus 79, but this one I would think potentially is more accurate and it gives me a range. So when we see patients, we have to think about, can we look at their qualities of what we're gonna do? We can look at their, this is basically a utility score for people in finance, but this is the idea. If you invest in somebody, if you radiate them, they probably have a hit and then they get better. This is their utility. But then over time, they may succumb to their disease. Surgery, maybe it's a bigger hit and they maybe have longer duration, but then they succumb. If you hit both, maybe you have a... Still comes down to us, physicians or other providers. It shouldn't just be physicians; it should be uh, students, nurse practitioners, PAs, all allied health. But that these arm us so that we can actually work with patients in a much more educated way. So these are the areas that you should think about. Um, again, use everyone that can give you information on this. I always think about the wisdom of crowds: your sarcoma board, your tumor board, your patients, your colleagues, your mentors, and research. And those are young people out there. This is how we get better. If you have any problems sleeping. Uh, anytime this uh, next coming year, I'll send you my book. Uh, but there's another thing where we kind of go through these tumors. But if you have problems sleeping, this is a nice way to get to sleep on time. Uh, thank you. I know time's short. I just wanted to finish up. Thank you so much, Roger and the team for listening. Uh, sorry, I flew through that last part, but I want to make sure I didn't keep you guys too long. Thank you so much again. And that was great. Uh, you definitely covered uh, a lot of topics from the basic to the complex, uh, especially the end was really fascinating. Um, so we'll open this up for questions. We certainly have some time for questions. So if anybody has any comments or. Uh, Roger, this is Dan. Um, uh, great talk, Dan, as usual. I, I had one question, uh, uh, not so much about uh, tumors itself, but uh, you know, uh, treatment of tumors in the spine is getting so complex. I wonder if you foresee a day in the near future when uh, we will recommend that uh, anyone with a spine tumor only be treated by somebody who specializes in spine tumors as opposed to a general spine surgeon? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Dan, and thank you for attending, and it's great to see you. You know, I think that, I, I think there's a natural tension in that question. Uh, the nat natural thing is, is that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that when I went, when I went, the last time I went to China, uh, I was talking with a gentleman, as you know, who only does like C1, C2 fusions, right? So, they have a they have a, a setup in their country where they really send the most complex things to a, and that's their setup. Um, I remember when uh, one of the, the the people that was taking me around said, "Dr. Shuba, who's who's the best who's the best at spine tumors in America?" And I said, "Who's the best in America? Everyone. Everyone's the best." So I think what happens is you have this this natural tension where, for example, in my new role, uh, which has a larger administrative role, they want expertise in every single hospital. They don't want to give up anything to anyone, right? So there's this natural tension of saying, we want a Dan Rue everywhere. Dan, teach it and, 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 and multiply yourself. And then you say, well, I, I don't know if I can clone myself. So there's this idea of, does everyone fly in to see Dan? Or does Dan, you know, somehow there's quality control where everyone that you have action. And I see this as a tension between the, the, uh, the, uh, the ability of us to treat patients in, the, in rural areas and people who are are not able to travel, but you're right. And I, I think obviously I, I agree with you in these really complex ones, we shouldn't have people who are uh, not experienced experimenting. On the other hand, if you're in the middle of the rural area, I guess you gotta do your best. So 
Great question. I don't have an answer for you. Obviously, you know that I think these complex ones should be really thought about a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Dan, it's Roger. I was just wondering, you know, somebody like yourself, who's obviously renowned for, for tumor surgery, tumor oncology, you come to a major institution uh, where you now, and you're trying to set up a system where not only are you going to take care of really complex spinal cases, but you, I, I assume you want to implement or improve the overall care of spinal oncology. How do you set that up? Uh, how do you, do you work? Uh, do you start, uh, and obviously, probably depends a little bit on the, on the existing infrastructure, but how do you set that up looking at the big picture, you know, spinal oncology uh, from an organizational perspective? Yeah, I, I, you know, there's a lot of components of that answer, but one that I think comes to mind the most, and I still think is like the North Star in this, uh, as opposed to the, 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 the logistics and the tactical issues, which I'm, I'm very, very fascinated by is the simple thing that people, all of us can, we have a lot of things to do in our day and we get into our comfort zones and it takes a lot of energy and convincing for me to change what I do. So if you think you want a team that you know has great people, you have to convince those team members that spending time on something like an integrated spinal oncology group is worth their time. Why would they not just see the patient in their clinic, do what they think? Why do they have to show up to a board or an issue? And so that's the simple thing. And the way that uh, I've learned the hard way is you can't tell people, I got this great idea. You should show up because no one shows up to your meeting. You actually have to help them. You have to learn from them what their pain points are. So for example, radiation oncologists might say, all I want is to know that I can call you guys when it's an unstable fracture. And that service that you then provide to them allows them to engage and go, well, all I want from you radiation oncology is to tell me if I leave smarter this tumor, you can kill the rest of it with radiation. And there lies this, this, this camaraderie. So as you start building, if you say, hey, you know, start coming to this and start having this group, people just don't do it because they got other things to do. But if you sit there and say, what would it look like if you to make it worth your time? And sometimes it's coffee and sometimes it's donuts and sometimes it's being involved in a paper and sometimes it's recognition. But most of the time it's tell me what really drives you crazy and we want to find a way to have another person there to, to help you with that. And once you start doing that, people find the time to say, this is worth my time. And so that's the idea of a team in, in my mind, building a team and specifically with radiation oncology. I mean, with uh, uh, spinal oncology. Wow, that's great. Any other comments, questions? There's one question here uh, uh, about the app. What's the name of the app for calculating the SIN score? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. But if you look up SIN score uh, on your phone, you'll probably get multiple different apps. Um, and maybe that's good. Maybe I'm not plugging any specific uh, vendor. But you can basically look. There's a number of apps that show TLIX, SLIX, and they have all of them together. KPS, so that you have to sit there and, you know, hunt and has grade, all these things. Now, uh, another question of BMP. What's your, what's your opinion about BMP? And, you know, there was some, there was some concerns with BMP and, uh, and using uh, tumor growth. Is that a, do you use BMP in your cases? Yeah, actually, it's a great question. I actually have a whole talk on that. And basically, the, the nutshell of that talk, you don't have to sit through that talk. I'll give you the, the cliff notes. The deal is, if it's a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, like a breast cancer going to the spine, uh, you probably can use BMP because there's a number of data showing that it may even make the uh, breast cancer more differentiated. However, if you operate an osteosarcoma, which is basically a bone tumor, of course, and we have people like Dan Rue here who are like, yes, Dan, I, I corroborate that osteosarcoma comes from the bone. He knows more about it than I do. But if you give BMP to an osteosarcoma, it puts it on steroids. It really, you know, anabolic steroids, that is, and it really kind of blows it up. So, uh, and there's some issues, some prostate cancers, uh, they're well differentiated. BMPs uh, chill them out. Some very blastic prostate cancers, maybe not the case. So what the issue is, is you might consider that. Now, I have a patient who has a cord had a chordoma and, and, and he got infected and I took all of his bone graft out and then he fractured his rods. So he never fused. I, I, he was about three or four years out and I think he'd fractured twice, maybe, maybe longer. And I said, you're getting BMP now. And I said to him, this is a really, really risky thing because you had chordoma like four or five years ago. And he's now like six years out with no chordoma and he's fused. So I think the answer is you have to talk to the patients about this risk. Uh, Medtronic, who really developed this, this thing, has a, has a package insert against them. And that's really medically going to protect them 
from the down, you know, the downside of people just throwing it in anyone. But if you're going to take it off label, which is what we're discussing, you have to have a long conversation with the patient saying, I think this is safe and, uh, and hear what they have to say. And they have to sign off on that. Dan, it's Mark Belsky. That was a stupendous talk. Thank you so much. Just a quick one on BMP with tumor. You know, it's a black box contraindication warning from the FDA. So you're really going out on a limb if you're going to do it. You really need to document and justify. But, you know, we realistically have never used it. And you're right. It does. It's sometimes antineoplastic, uh, but you couldn't get that. And Sonny Sandrazen actually went to the, to the FDA to try to get it approved, and they absolutely denied him. So just be really careful, not in your case, because you have experience and you know how to to uh, navigate that, but I certainly wouldn't do it as a matter of routine. Completely agree, Mark, completely agree. And I, and I actually, uh, when I'd written a paper, I'll just tell you that when I'd written a paper on how uh, in rats with human cancer, human breast cancer, we showed that it actually made the tumor get smaller. Uh, I was contacted by Medtronic to say, um, when are you gonna publish that? Cause we have to change potentially our advertising, which will cost us millions and millions of dollars. It was, I mean, so there's so much into this about watching and careful uh, people want to be very careful about what they're teaching people. And so I think your, your lesson is exactly right that, you know, almost a hundred percent chance that you don't use it. Uh, but um, it's obviously being studied in some cases that may be the rare, rare ones. So uh, only, I, I completely agree with you, Mark. Thank you for right. making it, Mark, by the way.